The Class Divide initiative came about as a result of the Hopkins Center staff really looking around at our community and saying, what's going on in our community? And what are the discussions that need to be happening that aren't happening? Class Divide as a word, as a phrase, calls our attention to serious injustice that is around us every day and that we're trained to turn a blind eye to. Class is, is a profound divider in the United States, but one that we're not allowed to talk about, and that's equally true on the Dartmouth campus, where we talk about every kind of difference except that one, by and large. And, uh, and it's particularly powerful, I think, in northern New England because of the lack of racial and ethnic diversity. I think it's on the minds of students who come here to talk about class divide in a productive way, so I think it's both the responsibility of the college and the students here to do it. It's at the forefront of, of knowledge and teaching, you know, young minds of tomorrow about, about the world that we live in. So, I mean, I think it has a duty to its students to teach about class divide. Nobody really ever talks about class. And it's sort I mean, and I think just, that just reflects the bigger American scape of how we address it. To me, this project is absolutely core to our mission as, as an institution of higher learning and challenging and, and building, um, educating the next leaders of the, of the world. Class difference in our community, in, in both the university campus as well as in the broader community in which Dartmouth found itself, was a subject that, A, was very difficult for people to talk about and therefore almost was never talked about, and B, a subject that therefore the arts can posit difficult issues in a way that aren't exactly a direct conversation, but force direct conversations. The way we chose to build the architecture of this project was very unusual for us. We thought, let's create a series of strands, because the whole idea here is how many partners can we work with in different ways to get lots of people engaged. We had a very strong strand that was programming. That's what we know how to do. We love to do it. We brought incredible artists. Another strand was to create one relationship with one artist that could span all three years. And of course, that was Anne Galjur, this extraordinary playwright. For over 100 years, my husband Bert and I have been trying to retire. But every time we have a plan, something always comes up. If it's not a hurricane, it's a flood. If it's not a flood, it's losing your job at the mill. And we lived at Birch Pine Village, and every month it seemed like the rent was going up. Mm. So we bought a three-bedroom trailer out at Mascoma Lake and lived there for nine years. Wow. And then we came here. Some of the stories from when you guys were very young here uh, in Hanover and in, in this area uh, that I, I so love. A growing number of people in our country here, where I live, a lot of places, a growing number of people feel invisible, that their needs what they think, uh, they, they feel invisible. When I asked him to hang my sampler, he made such a fuss. I don't and if you feel invisible for a long time, you get resentful. And you feel like, what, what can I hope for? I was really inspired by um, the times that I've spent with you here and places I've visited here. So, uh, and I play all these characters, okay? So, here you go. For years, my husband Bert and I have been trying to retire. But every time we have a plan, something always comes up. And visited Romano Circle and did some scenes from the play at Romano Circle. And um, I had been hoping to have an explicit conversation about class, that is, leap in and talk about talking about class. And, and, uh, and I, I understood from the impact of the, of the scenes that the artful way of doing it without the, the tangential way, the way of presenting it with great compassion was much more uh, engaging. I was surprised that the realtor uh, couldn't afford a house. I love that the realtor couldn't afford a house. There's <laughs> always these things you read about that you should always have so many months of savings. Who has yeah. savings? It's like, what? Well, that <laughs> is something I learned uh, again through all my happy hours here and all of our visits. <laughs> that 
Melissa was the one who said it. You know, most people are two or three paychecks away from homelessness. You captured a lot of what I, I've experienced here, but what I've also experienced not being in here. <laughs> so from the outside looking in and from the inside looking out both, I was just like, wow. And some of the things you know, it's like, oh, I remember hearing that at the table. I remember saying that. <laughs> Wait a minute. We're a society based on capitalism. And you get what you go after. And if you go after it and you get it, great. And if you go after it and you don't get it, you're a failure and you deserve what you don't have. Like back, I think, at the end of World War II when the whole baby boomer thing was happening, it, it was kind of a given that you would do better than the generation before you. And that is gone. Our pastoral reality, what would Wordsworth say? If William Wordsworth were to move to the Upper Valley, could he afford a $1,500 a month cottage by the lake as a poet? Would he have to labor as a public school teacher? Would he have the energy to write his poems at the end of each day? I was very struck by the Anne Galjur um, play in that uh, one individual played many different roles. And in doing so, I guess I had I already believed this, but it brought me, I think, to a deeper understanding that um, we are all pretty much the same. We're all of the same worth as human beings. The title of the play, that you can't get there from here, I, I think a lot about that in New Hampshire, because I think in New Hampshire we're, we're ranked number one in wealth and health and well-being and happiness, and that just does not reflect reality for a huge portion of the state. You know, the students are going to come out of here with an excellent education. They're going to be able to communicate on paper. They're going to go out into the community. So the impact of this particular initiative has concentric circles that we're not aware of. We're maybe never going to know, but it's happening. When I got to Iris's place, I could see her garden was all torn up. I walked inside. Everything smelled like patchouli from her incense. There she was, hunched over a pile of papers on a dining room table. I can't find my title. For your work? No, my mortgage. It's been sold so many times, I can't find the title for my house. There's a lot of like hostility and tension coming from both sides, and I feel that the work you're doing is really great in promoting conversation about class, but do you ever feel like it could backfire in terms of the issue being a very personal and very kind of heated thing with a lot of unresolved resentment? Well, I'd say, we got a lot of unresolved resentment, period. P it's just there. If you look at what's really going on, it's between the lower classes, lower middle class, and the middle class. That's where the big pressures are. <laughs> Another strand of the project has been a set of relationships with high schools in the Upper Valley. We felt that the high school student is at an age where their ideas have not been completely formed about the world around them, but they're sophisticated enough to really know what they think class divide is and what they're seeing and what their experiences are, and they can articulate those. Sure. Why is everybody calling me yeah, Sped right. when yeah. all we need is a little extra help? And that's how we have it. Yeah. It's very good. It's, 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 it's really, really good, believe yeah. me. Oh. Come on, come on, come on. Let's get the class. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. You heard the bell. How come everyone calls us Speds when we just need a little extra help? That's not fair. Why don't we go talk about it? Not a lot of kids, sort of, or especially me, realize the classism in our area, because it really does exist. I'm going to ask for 10 people to volunteer to play the population of the United States, each one of the 10 people being one-tenth of the total population. Each chair, one-tenth of the total privately owned wealth in the US. Which of you would like to play the role of the wealthiest 10% of the population? <laughs> Okie dokie, what's your name? Corey. So one, two, three, four, five, six of you are going to get off your chairs and actually get on these chairs with these three people. I'm serious. 
So if we were to ask you to let just one of your legs represent the wealthiest 1%, your leg would have about three and a third chairs. So can you get one of your legs on three and a third chairs? Wow, well, we have a homeless population over here. Uh, how's I'm it, actually on this chair. You have a space I'm, on the chair, yeah. I'm on this You have a piece. Yeah. He's squatting. He's squatting, okay. Yeah. How about, are, are you on the chair? No, boy, I wish I could be over in Hanover over there, though. That'd be great. <laughs> Do you think race and class are connected? How and why? Um, I think they used to be. What class do you associate your friends with? My students and I are doing a five minute video on what class means to us. How do you dissect and define class? How do you define poverty? If you're born into poverty, can you work out of it? Are there geographical and racial implications to class? And the answers that they're finding are really surprising. And it's a wonderful experience because we're finding these answers out together. I didn't come in knowing the answers. Do you think that if you're born into poverty, you can work out of it? Of course. Why? Because we can do anything we want, as long as you put your mind to it. Another strand of the project has been student internships. And there's been one every, almost every quarter of the three years. I thought I'd apply for the internship, and I was lucky enough to get it. Um, and for that, those three months um, where I worked with Margaret and worked with the office, Class Divide kind of took over my life um, in, a really, in a really interesting way because it was more than just going to the office and kind of like looking over everything and thinking of what I was going to do. It was suddenly a conversation and a dialogue that I was having continually with everyone, with every group that I, that I contacted to work with, with every professor that I talked to. It suddenly became a reoccurring theme. Our charge to them is create a project that engages fellow students in this topic and it has to be creative in some way. At the beginning of this term, um, we printed out postcards that were four by six that were blank on one side, and on the other side, they were addressed to my HB. And the only direction was share a secret about socioeconomic class. I think that a lot of people care deeply about class here. There's been three years of programming. A lot of people are thinking about class divide issues. But the question is whether they're actually talking about it all the time, or whether they're talking about it in a way that lets them really talk about how they feel about it. And I think that what this secrets allowed people to do was say what they feel and allow us to use these ideas for discussion without putting a specific name on it. Dartmouth, as this cultural and academic force, has a duty to the community. We're not only a place where we go to learn, we're a place where students can um, affect change in their community and feel that like they're making a difference. What's their next question? What class do you associate your friends with? I think it's really important that you guys synthesize a little bit of what you've taken away from the film. Being like, we've interviewed all these people and we found out that everyone thinks they're middle class and some people clearly that's are That's true though, class. that's really interesting. It Whether it's true. middle, lower, middle, upper, it doesn't matter. Yeah, everybody Every, has said middle, upper, everyone everyone middle, 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 middle. If Dartmouth doesn't do it, who else is going to do it? I, I don't see any other institutions or organizations coming into these places and having these dialogues with kids. I thought about it in more like a stereotypical way, like the way you dress or like what like you do with your vacation times and stuff and then kind of coming into this, it kind of like focused it and let me think about it in a lot of different ways. It really also shows like a lot of similarities between people. Like you could even be like in a higher class and be like talking to somebody of a lower class and realize that there are still similarities within the people and you don't have to like discriminate against other classes. It doesn't seem like a lot, you know, I have five students in my class, it doesn't seem like I'm, I'm affecting a lot of change, but if I can affect those five students to move them to go and talk about class with other students, and those students go and talk to other students, it becomes a chain effect. Change is something that happens one by one. My really great honor to introduce you all to the members of Sweet Honey and the Rock. A very important component for us was that this initiative should relate to the academic side of Dartmouth. So I mean, there's a lot of productive discussion going on right now, and it's a direct outgrowth of the Class Divide project. Uh, you know, we, they kind of shamed us into moving uh, and inspired us into moving and got our thoughts going. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of excitement uh, on campus and ripples into the community that have come out of this project. And it's my hope that, you know, within the next few years, uh, we'll have a minor, you know, we'll have a presence in the Dartmouth course catalog so that students applying to the institution say, hey, look at this, you know, I can concentrate on issues of socioeconomic privilege and inequality. Uh, how many of you know what SNCC 
was Students Nonviolent Coordinating yes. Committee. Right. The original SNCC Freedom Singers. They traveled all over the country. Um, in a sense, their songs were very much a newspaper. We start with a grounding in the civil rights movement. We start as women who are uh, African-American women with um, all that that entails in terms of our history and our legacy. Part of the reason why Sweet Honey's music, um, and music, right, in terms of African-American music, really resonates too, sort of through the decades, is because so many were forbidden to read, right? Um, and so having access to information, not through the written word, but through song, is still important for many people even today. In African cultures, in African American culture, music is not something that is used as art for art's sake. We don't have that luxury. Music is functional. It's the way you document who you are. It's the way you tell your story. And I don't care whether we're talking about the body of songs that were created during slavery, which we refer to as spirituals, or whether we're talking about hip hop. We're still telling our story through, through the music. We will stand the storm. It won't be long. We'll anchor by and by. We seeds that are planted in the arts are seeds that germinate and produce multiple blossoms. Oh, we will stay in the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. So often, I think in our culture today, any one of us, we don't know both sides. We just know our side. And less and less, we've been open to know the other side. So the Class Divide Initiative here at Dartmouth for me represents a breath of fresh air, opening that door and saying, let's none of us be afraid to know more sides of life. We created a community advisory board. It has been drawn from a variety of nonprofit organizations in the Upper Valley. But we have cast them aside. And we especially those who work with clients who are in need. Those are the people that we don't often see in our audiences. This whole process has really gotten into my head mm -hmm. and I am analyzing things differently and over this year have had some of the most interesting conversations with people about class and afterward I think, I didn't start that. I know I didn't start that, but how did we get on that? This issue of class is, is all around us and it, and it shows itself in really interesting ways that maybe without having that first conversation you didn't realize you needed to look at it that way the faculty members now jumping on board with the topic because they've all taken this on as a, uh, as, as a theme uh, this year. To think that the Arts Center on campus became the hub for this academic inquiry, you know, because we always sort of thought of as the entertainment center or the place you get your mail or your french fries. Um, but now it's a place that can get me thinking about class and what it means to me and my role on this campus. The conversation's happening, it started here uh, but it seems to have just traveled really throughout the campus. And as we see that, it, it's really kind of impressive, mm -hmm. I think, to, that my hope would be that it, it lives beyond this three-year initiative that the Hopkins Center has because it's, it's come to life in so many other parts of, the, of Dartmouth. The whole institution working together on a big subject has been shown to have highly productive outcomes at many levels. The audience impact was very strong. The curricular impact is strong. Our community partners felt it was a significant change in the way they viewed Dartmouth and the way Dartmouth viewed them. And so there were all of these um, sort of breaking down of barriers that this project helped to do that uh, are quite palpable and I think quite measurable. What we're really trying to do here is to take the artists that have the piece we play in the rock and insert them into a conversation with us. And so just to get our brains started, you know, what are some class indicators? You know, what are the things that we can tell about a person that identifies what class they might belong to? Kids who have fresh fruit and vegetables and 
the cheese and the cracker and not the packaged type foods. They're usually from a middle class, a little higher. Uh, who's had braces? I was thinking the same thing. There are a lot of things that are very accessible to a lot of people through credit cards. So mm -hmm. anybody can have an iPhone. Anybody can have a, a, a shearling coat. Anybody can actually have a mink. What is it to have class or be in a class? Is one exclusive of the other, or is you know what I'm saying? Is it what What's is the it? What is of class? it? People live within a very restricted strata, and sometimes don't even know what's accessible to other people, and so it has to do with access, and it has to do with um, yeah access. I've taught here for 23 years, and when I first arrived, I really was struck. For me, the class divide had to do with the sense of entitlement that mm -hmm. some students had and other students didn't have. As the students just naturally self-segregate themselves into their um, background, whether, I mean, something that I notice on campus, and this is kind of controversial whenever it's brought up, but people are very racially segregated. That's something that we don't like to admit, but it's very true if you look at the kinds of people that we sit with at lunch, the kinds of people we go out with. And then also class, I just, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm on financial aid and receiving a lot, and I notice that a lot of my close friends are in the same situation as me, and I'm not, really sure exactly how that came about, but it just did. I think at Dartmouth there are a lot of assumptions going on in a lot of different ways. Um, it's, it's always, I feel like I, I, the, the kind of class discussion comes up whenever people talk about financial aid, for instance. You know, it's always, are you paying financial aid? Because if you're not, you know, that means something about you. We end up making these stereotypes and it's unfair to the, ri the richest students at Dartmouth who don't necessarily deserve to be stereotyped that way, and the middle class students who truly don't have the finances to be stereotyped that way. So I think it's unfair for students of all groups. We're getting out in the morning. Yeah, where are you going? Thought we'd go up north a little. A fellow came by last night, says it might be work picking peaches. We ain't had work. We're out of food. Folks been so nice here. We had a bath every day. Never been so clean in my life. We hate to go. There just ain't no work. There are certain structures that are maintaining poverty. And those structures need to be changed. And our task as artists is to create the possibility of imagining another set of structures. It's really incredible you're doing this piece now. We're really fortunate to be theater people and to actually invite people to an alternate information system which lets you know what it's like to be poor and that it's not that you're a bad person. It's just you're poor. Which did you rather? I don't know. Boy, I guess. Sure, boy. You just got in, didn't you? Uh-huh. Gonna stay? I don't know. If we can get work, yes we will. You can get work. That's what we all say. The reason that we can take this on as artists is culture is the one field where all human beings actually are equal. You can't demonstrate equality politically, economically, but you can culturally. The Hopkins Center has changed. Our employees have changed on a personal level. Going to share with Our partnerships in the community have changed. Perspectives as we look at what the Hopkins Center brought to us uh, for this year and for a period of time as we think about the class divide. It is impolite. I mean, it's so bizarre in our society you know, that it's impolite to talk about class. It's time for us to actually be a bit impolite. We have changed the value proposition of the Hopkins Center to our own campus and community. We have deepened our value, and I think we've enriched the possibilities for what we can do in the future. How we go about constructing a society that has the poor who will be with us always, that's what it says in the Bible, and the rich, who will always make a way for themselves to be present, and all of those in between. We're going to have all of it. And so 
I'm not even sure that I want to continue to think about the divide. I want to think about the class inclusive. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Sing. As you bring issues out, so often there's we all have more in common than we ever knew, and it is again one of the natures of art, in my opinion, that that it does bring people together. So, it's the commonality rather than the than the differences that end up coming forward. Things we need to be talking about and keep silent. Well, I can tell you that artists have a wonderful opportunity to talk about it. All human beings are created equal. We're here as artists to prove that.